1 John chapter 3, starting in verse 7. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. He who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. The second passage is found in the book of John, chapter 10, verses 1 through 18. John chapter 10, starting in verse 1. And this is entitled, The Shepherd and His Flock. Starting in verse 1. I tell you the truth, the man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of his sheep. The watchman opens the gate for him, and the sheep listens to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but they did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who had ever come before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flocks and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life, only to take it up again. No one takes it from me but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. And our final passage is in James chapter 4, verse 7. James 4, verse 7. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. And that's our scripture readings and young children. This is time to be dismissed for children's church. Good morning. Grandmom's not here, so we're not having children's church, right? But you already knew that. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank you so much today for your word. We thank you that it is true, that it is always true, that we know that we can count on it. That no matter the deception and the lies that are out there, your story will come true. You are truth, and you do not depart from it. We thank you for this day to be able to come and worship you and study your word, Father. And I pray that you'll bind it upon our hearts, and that, Father, that we'll carry it into actions and we'll be the light that this world needs. I just pray that your spirit be upon this place today. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So you have to bear with me. My voice is not very good again today. It seems like Satan keeps attacking. So that's why today's message is called Knowing Your Enemy. Last night I had acid reflux and I thought I had nipped it in the bud because I took some pine nut oil. It's the most wonderful thing ever. It not only helps with acid reflux, but it cures your esophagus and stuff. I haven't had it in forever. And then last night I was up all night. I kept Sherry up all night and now my throat is about gone. Know your enemy. He doesn't want me up here today. He doesn't want this church to function. He doesn't want us to be a light for the world. I wasn't going to preach about this. I was going to go on on a different message. But I saw several things like this happening. I said, you know, we need to mention about what the devil's motives are and who he is. And that's what we're going to do today. A couple weeks ago, I told you about the story of life and that it was God's story. And I mentioned the different elements One of those elements was conflict, and there's where Satan comes in. He's been doing it from the beginning. He's not going to slow up. 
It's his agenda. He wants to be God. He's not going to be. Don't worry, it's God's story. But that's his motives. Don't forget that. He wants to turn you from him. If he can turn you from him and you don't accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, then you will die and spend an eternity apart from God, your Creator, in hell. God created you to be in a loving relationship with Him. He doesn't want that to happen. He loves you so much that He sent Jesus to pay the price for all your sins. Not only all of your sins, but all of humanity's sins. From the beginning of time to the end of time. Every grotesque detail, Jesus took all that burden upon Him and died for you. And not only did He die, but He defeated death so that we might live and have eternal life. That's the theme of this story. But we don't need to be unaware of where the conflict comes in and what Satan's job is. There are more names for Satan in the Bible than anyone other than Jesus Christ. So it's worth taking a look at and mentioning. He wants to destroy you. If you are a Christian, then you're saved. But he still wants to make you ineffective. Don't think he's not going to stop once you're saved. Matter of fact, when you're saved and you're focused on following God, he's going to attack you even more because he wants to make you ineffective. Because if you shine your light, just as the Bible says, then guess what? Maybe others will be drawn to that light. And he doesn't want that to happen. He wants to rob us of any blessings in this life and for all of eternity. That's his goal. Job chapter 1 verse 7 says this, The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, From roaming through the earth and going back and forth in it. That's what his purpose is, roaming, to cause havoc, to cause chaos. He doesn't stop. He doesn't take a time out. He's an eternal being. He doesn't need to rest. He is constantly plaguing people to keep them from the light. That's his purpose. Genesis 3, verse 1 says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to woman, Did, you, did God really say... You must not eat from any tree in the garden. He's not going to tell you his agenda. He's going to be slick about it. In fact, God says the serpent was more crafty than any other creature. He's wise. He's wise beyond your belief. You cannot face him alone. You'll need the strength of the Holy Spirit. You'll need to keep your eyes focused on God. Or he will wear you down. As most of us know, because he's washed down before. I mean, there's no reason to say that he, he hasn't, that he can't. If you say that he can't, then you're foolish. And we looked at the example of Solomon a few weeks back that had the most wisdom of any man ever, but he turned his eyes from God and believed deception and lies that Satan led him into believing. Second Corinthians 11.3 says this, But I am afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, so we've got a little different word, cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Paul is writing this as a warning so that they don't forget. Just as Eve fell, you can't blame it on her and say, we have sinned because Eve fell and Adam fell. You've sinned. You've sinned from the beginning. You will continue to sin. Thank goodness if you're a Christian, you're saved by grace. Ephesians 6.12 says, and this is Paul again talking, he says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. There is evil, and they're out in force to bring you down, to keep you ineffective, to capture your soul for all of eternity, because there's no second chances. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to make it to God, and you can't. Jesus Christ paid it all. He was the perfect sacrifice. But you've got to follow him. You've got to focus on him. You've got to be aware of what Satan is doing. 1 John 3, verses 7 and 8, says, Dear children, Paul's talking to him like, just have the understanding of a child. Sometimes that's the easiest way to look at something. Do not let anyone lead you astray. This world today is so full of lies, full, so full of deception. For many years, I said, well, the Bible says, if a man doesn't work, he shall not eat. So my God was work. It warns against that. But I took a verse out of context. I let Satan mislead me, misdirect me, and I thought that I was working hard creating this business so that my wife and son could have plenty. 
They didn't need plenty. They needed me. They needed me to be the example for them, to be a father that would teach them how to, to love God and honor God and respect Him. He who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. The Bible's clear again. Jesus Christ came to destroy the devil's work, to save our souls. That was his purpose in coming, to bring about God's theme of reconciliation through Jesus Christ. He loves you so much. He loves the church. And as a Christian, you need to be effective. You need to be focused on him. You need to be telling others about him, shining your light. And as a church, we need to do that also. And so many times, conflict arises. We've had trouble doing the bulletins for three weeks. This, this time, it was fairly easy because we let Satan know that you're not going to kick our butt here. First week, we couldn't have a bulletin because we went to print it and there was X's and Y's. I didn't know what to do. I just gave up and we went to print it Sunday morning. So there wasn't any going back to, to the house and getting it off that computer there. I guess something got corrupt when we put it on the stick drive. I don't know. And then the second time with the bulletin, we're like, we're going to be prepared this time. The power goes out. So we come into the work at 6 a.m., bring it up, get the bulletin to print, praise God, and take a sponge bath so we can get in here. You know, Satan's working hard. And then we had a misprint in the bulletin. Satan is just wanting us to focus on the insignificant and quarrel and fight among us. We have no music today, but we're going to get by this, and it's going to be great. We're going to have a great time because we don't have anybody here to lead the music. That should not stop us. Any quarrels that we have or anything should not even slow us down because he's in control. It's his plan, his story, and we just need to ride in conjunction with that. And when we realize we're not, when we realize that we're letting those things cloud our judgment or get in the way, we need to stop, drop to our knees, pray, put those burdens upon his shoulders because our shoulders are not big enough to take them and get back up and start walking the way we're supposed to walk, talk the way we're supposed to talk to lead others to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ thought it was important enough to leave his throne in heaven, come down to his creation, be born a baby with no abilities. A baby's helpless. Train himself up to the Father's will. He was tempted by Satan, as we'll see in a little bit. He was successful. And he died an utter agonizing death because every soul was that important to him and to God. And we should be the same way. Don't ever forget how much God loves you. In the bulletin, we've put a bunch of Bible verses, and I'm going to go over them fairly quickly. They are Satan's names and what Satan does, so that way that we can understand that a little bit better. I pray that you take those home and you spend more time in them, that you meditate upon them, that you study God's Word to find out exactly what Satan does. Because like in any battle, if you did not know your enemy and you did not know the enemy's strategy, you did not know their goals, how could you fight them effectively? You're going to get killed, plain and simple. And in this battle, it's not you getting killed, it's eternal damnation. Your soul lives on. So if you die, game is not over, game is just starting. So where you spend eternity is the most important decision you'll make. And then after that, what you can do for God's kingdom. First passage we want to go to is Revelation 9, verse 11. It says, They had as king over them the angel of the abyss, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek, Apollyon, which means destruction. That's Satan's purpose, to destroy not just to irritate, not to win a small victory, but to destroy you and destroy everyone. That's his purpose. Revelation 12 verse 9 says, The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. The King James Version says, which deceives the whole world. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. So he's a great dragon. He's a mighty force. Not just a mighty force, but something that breathes fire. Something that we can't kill. God is comparing it to a mighty, fierce creature. And he's an ancient serpent. He's been around a long time. He's going to be around until God finishes the story. Not till we do, but God does. 
And his purpose is to lead the whole world astray or be the deceiver for the whole world. Not just you. He's not done when he gets you or someone else. He's to, his goal is to deceive the whole world and turn them against God. Matthew thirteen thirty nine says, And the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of age, and the harvesters are the angel. It's clear Satan is our enemy. 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 3 and 4 says, Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed. The man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and he will exalt himself over everything that is called God or his worship, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Not only is he a man of lawlessness, not only does he want to destroy, he wants to be God. But he's a false God, isn't he? He's not going to be God. He never will be. But his purpose is to be God. And we need to be aware of that. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says this, The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers, so they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So he, the Bible says that he's the God of this age. We wonder why things are the way they are. Satan is leading them. We have a big fight in front of us. Like I said, society tells you that this is the American dream. You shouldn't worry about anything but what you can achieve for yourself. That's nowhere found biblically whatsoever. It says you're number, you're number one, you're important, and so many other things. Satan wants to destroy you. He's going to be deceptive in it. He's the ultimate deceiver. That's his purpose. That's his goal. It's been that way from the beginning. It's not going to change. He wants to, make, he wants to not only cost you your salvation, but he wants to make you ineffective, therefore costing others their salvation. Isaiah 27.1 says this, In that day the Lord will punish with his sword his fierce, great, and powerful sword, Leviathan, the gliding serpent. Leviathan, the coiling serpent. He will slay the monster of the sea. So here Satan's compared to a monster. And if you notice, it said gliding serpent. That means he's traveling to and from again, seeing what he can get into. And coiling serpent. What's a serpent do before he's ready to strike? He coils up. So Satan is always roaming around, always ready to strike. We need to be aware of that. John 8, 44 says, You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of all lies. When you tell that first little lie, or you lie because you think it's a little bit easier to do because that the truth might hurt someone's feelings or make things worse, worse, you're obeying your father of lies. You're falling into his snare, his trap. That's what he wants you to do so that he can murder you and murder anyone else who falls into that snare. John 10.10 10 says the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. Well, I don't know, a lot of thieves don't come in to kill. They have no intent to kill. But this thief has every intention of killing and destroying. So he's not only a thief here to rob you of your riches, rob you of glory in this life, but he wants to kill and destroy you. Unlike Jesus, who came that you can have life to the fullest, and that doesn't mean that you'll have more toys or more things. That means that if you follow him, you'll understand the story. That you'll see through his eyes how important a soul is. That you'll follow after God's plan rather than your own. 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen says, And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. He doesn't come in his true form. He comes in something that you don't expect. Something that you would even believe, want to believe. So when he tells you that lie, you, you say, huh, maybe that is God's will for me. It makes sense when he's just trying to deceive you and he comes as something that he's not. So we have to be very, very careful. 
Matthew 4 verse 3 says, The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, let these stones too become bread. And in Mark 1 13 he says, And he was in the desert forty days being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals and angels attended to him. Jesus Christ faced every temptation you faced, all the suffering that you faced, and he was victorious. He lived a life so that you could see the victory through him, not on your own ability, but through him, so that he could be a righteous sacrifice for you, that he could take your place and pay the penalty of sin. He was tempted for 40 days. I doubt very seriously you've been tempted straight for 40 days, but Jesus was in a weakened state because he was fasting. But also in that state, he was seeking God. That was his reason for fasting. He was keeping his eyes on heaven and God's plans. So when Satan came to him, guess what? He was focused, and he didn't have any problem with it. Revelation 12, verse 10 says, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven crying, saying, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ for the accuser of our brothers who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. Satan accuses he accuses us not only to God, and he does it day and night, but he accuses us to ourselves, so we doubt ourselves. So we say, there's no way that I could be up here preaching today because I was up half the night. I don't have a voice for it. My voice was worse this morning. It seems to be getting better now. Praise God. I am tired. It's not by my ability. It's by his might, his strength. He wants us in our weakness to see his strength. All we've got to do is see it and accept it. We can't do anything. And yes, we've done plenty of bad things that could keep us from being ineffective, couldn't we? But he doesn't hold that against us. Satan can go on accusing all he wants. But Jesus Christ paid that penalty once and for all. There's nothing you ever did, nothing you will ever do, that will keep you from the salvation of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2, verses 1 and 2 says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. We're fighting a spiritual battle. We're not fighting a battle to see how much we can make or, or what things we can accomplish, what fame or fortune. Every one of us, when our life is over, will be a tombstone saying who we were with a dash that represents our life and then our death. What matters is how we loved, how we showed an example of Jesus Christ, and brought others to that light. That's all that will matter when it's over with. It won't matter how much that, that we did for humanity. That's a great thing if you invent vaccines and stuff. That's a wonderful thing. But once people die, they face eternal judgment. That's what matters. Their souls. <clears throat> Ephesians 6.12 says, For you strug your struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities and the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realm. King Ver James Version says, spiritual wickedness in high places. Wickedness, terrible evil. Luke eleven fifteen says, But some of them said, By Beelzebub, the ruler or prince of demons, he is driving out demons. Satan has an army. It's not him alone. Even though we couldn't face him alone, he has an army of demons that are plaguing us, that are telling us we're worthless, that are telling us we can't do anything, that are saying quarrel against each other. They're saying this person offended me, so I'm not going to do this or that. That's their purpose day in, day, at, day in and night. And they're, they're not going to stop from their agenda. They're not going to let up. They're not going to say, oh, poor person, he's breaking. That's their goal. That's what they want to do. John 12, 31 and 32 says, Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. But I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Be self-controlled and alert. For your enemy, or King James Version says your adversary, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. That's his intent. He roams around seeing who he can rob of eternal riches. Who's not ready, not expecting him. 
even the person who has the most wisdom in all this world, he found the ways to fool him, to turn him into a fool instead of the wisest man ever. He found a way for Eve to break one simple rule. She didn't have a list of them. She had one rule in a perfect environment. She had everything she wanted. It was perfect. She didn't face disease and death and things that we face. It was perfect. She couldn't follow one rule because Satan came in and said, Did God really say that? And then he played on her emotions to be more than what she was. To doubt God. To not trust God. To lose focus. And she fell. And that's Satan's goals. So be alert, because that's what Satan does. And Ephesians 6.16 says, In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. I don't know about you, but if somebody's shooting flaming arrows at me, he's my enemy. He's attacking me. He's an attacker. And he is wicked or evil. So what can I do to fight him? If you don't know your adversary, how can you fight the battle? Okay? If you have time, spend time on them. So what foe are you facing in this life? Is it raising your children? Is it your job? Is it cancer? Or is your foe the devil and what he's doing? All the other things should be insignificant. Yes, we face them because this world is tainted by sin. It was our choice that made it that way again. And it will be perfect one day. But right now you're called to fight God's story. Not your own. You will either align yourself for victory with Him, or if you don't align yourself with Him, guess what? Satan has already fooled you. Because your primary purpose is to serve God, to be focused on His needs and desires. And His desires to have a loving relationship with everyone. Even that person you can't stand. That person that has hurt your feelings. He wants, you, he wants to have a relationship with them. So why shouldn't you not? There's nothing that they can do that should stop you from shining your light to them, from witnessing to them that might draw them to salvation. If you're saved and you know it, clap your hands. If you're saved and you know it, stomp your feet. If you're saved and you know it, then what next? Ah, your life should surely show it. Is it? And I'm not pointing fingers, because again, I'll have three of them pointing back at me. I am not one to point fingers, I'm one to read God's Word. <clears throat> I hope and pray that you'll join the fight. We can follow Jesus' example in Matthew 4, verses 1 through 11. It says this, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit. That's the first step. Into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, let these stones become bread. Jesus answered, because he knew Scripture, he had been meditating on it. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Not the ones we pick and choose, but every word. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you're the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written... Here's where Satan tries to use Scripture even against him. He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. But Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, I will give you, he said, if you bow down and worship me. Now he's showing a little bit of his true intent. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. There's ten commandments, and there's more than that that say, Do this, don't do this. But there are tons of commands. There's like a thousand of them in the New Testament where Jesus said, Do this, follow me, take up your cross, go and preach the gospel. So the ten commandments are great, and if you follow them, you should want to do the other things. But don't just focus on the, I shouldn't steal, I shouldn't commit adultery. Focus on what you should do. You should be that light to the world. It's a desperate, wicked battle that every soul is facing. And you're called to be the hands and feet. You're called to be the light. If you go down to verse 17, it says, From that time on, Jesus began to preach. He knew what to do. He knew the story. 
So after he was tempted and everything, what did he do? He went and preached. He could have went back and done something else. Wouldn't have been anything wrong with it. But he knew that he was called to go preach and teach. Once you become saved, that is your calling. The Great Commission says to go and preach the gospel message to all the world and make disciples thereof so that they can do the same thing. Because we're in a battle. We're in a spiritual battle against wickedness in heavenly places. Jesus lived out the example that we should follow. He taught us in His words. He was very clear, very specific. And He stayed focused. We can look at His example to learn how to live. Ephesians 6, verses 11 through 13 says, Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's scheme. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And I could go into this all day. But the point is, is it's a battle. If you're not prepared, not only if you don't know who your enemy is, what fight you're your cause that you're fighting for. You can know all those things, but if you go into the battle unprepared, you have no gun, you have no armor, anything else, you're going to get annihilated. So Paul is clear, put on the whole armor of God. This is a battle. He reinforces that. You're not just facing a foe that's not going to attack you. They're out to destroy you, and you've got to be equipped. Second Thessalonians 3, verses 1 through 5 says, Finally, brothers, pray for us that the message of the Lord may... Be spread rapidly and be honored, just as it is with you. And pray that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men. For not everyone has faith, but the Lord is faithful. He will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. You don't have anything to worry about. Satan can't take away your salvation. If the worst thing that happens is somehow he takes away your life, guess what? He didn't win. He lost. Because you will spend eternity with Jesus Christ. We have confidence in the Lord that you are doing and will continue to do the things we command. May the Lord direct your hearts into God's love and Christ's perseverance. Even Paul struggled with it. If you go on to read his words, it says, Why do I do the things that I choose not to do? And he asked for prayer. He knew the importance of prayer. So he told us to put on the armor. He told us to stay focused and and draw our strength from Christ. He told us to pray. And then the last verse that Barry read this morning, James 4, 7, it says, Submit yourselves. Submit yourself. Give yourself wholeheartedly to God. Not part. Not give Him a part of your life. Not hold that closet back in that you don't want anyone to find out in your heart what's back there. He says, Submit yourself. Submit means that you give yourself to the authority. The authority that God is. You put your trust in Him. Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. It's a promise again. You don't have to worry about it. If you stand firm, the devil knows he has no ground. He'll eventually leave you alone. And just think, if you're doing that, what a mighty witness you can be. So I challenge you today, if you have any things you need to get out of your life that you need to submit, submit them. If there are any quarrels or anything that are causing you To to not be effective, deal with them. Focus wholeheartedly. Be prepared. Go home and study about who and what Satan is. Realize that we're fighting a battle. Realize that this is not our life to live, but God's life. He bought you with a very horrific, costly price. The death of Jesus Christ. We're in a battle. A terrible battle. But a battle, if you're a Christian, you know what the outcome will be. Why would you not want to be a mighty soldier and be an effective part in that battle? He's calling all of us in the battle today. We're going to face many things upcoming in this church, and we can deal with them. All we have to do is focus on God. But we don't need to just deal with them on our own. We need to focus on them and deal with them collectively as a body of Christ. Because it is wonderful when you have your brothers and sisters reaching down to help you when you fall when they're patting you on your back when you're doing well, when they're helping guide you, when they see that maybe you shouldn't be doing exactly what you're doing or maybe that's the wrong road to start stepping on. I cherish every one of you. I cherish the 
wisdom that you have. And as a church, I want to fight a fight where we go out and show the devil who we are, that we're focused as a church on God. And I pray that that's your calling today as well. If you'll bow your heads with me. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the truth that we can find there. Help us to meditate on it day and night so that we can be ready to face the things that the devil throws at us, that he won't make us ineffective, but that we'll be mighty soldiers, and not by our might, but through your might and power, and in our weaknesses we can become strong. We just thank you so much for all that you've done, especially for sending your son to die on the cross for us, that you loved us so much, despite anything that we could ever do, you still love us and you still want us. And we thank you for the victory through Jesus Christ, that we can become children of God, and we can spend eternity with you forever. Help us to be the light to the world that we need to be. And I pray these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.